Fantastic. Okay, so thank you all for coming today for this seminar on radical methodologies for the post-humanities. And this is actually the third seminar in a series. Um, I hope you've been to the other two too. The other two were disrupting the scholarly establishment and the aesthetics of the humanities, which took place last year. Uh, and together these seminars formed the Disrupting the Humanities seminar series. So they've been organized by Coventry University's Center for Disruptive Media. Um, and if you're interested in the center, you can find more information at disruptivemedia.org.uk. Um, the seminar series as a whole focuses in particular on doing scholarship in a post-humanities context. So exploring what a post-humanist practice or performance of scholarship might entail, whilst not neglecting the media devices, institutions and economies that we use to communicate and distribute our research. It does want to critically examine the heritage that accompanies the present day humanities, whilst reflecting on a possible open, alternative and affirmative future humanities that questions its own humanist legacy. So this seminar series is also accompanied by a wiki or a resource platform where resources related to the themes of the seminars as well as the recordings and materials of the various seminars are brought together for reuse in research and education. And as it is a wiki, everybody will be able to add his or her own material, which has culminated in already a rich collection of resources. So you can see for the previous seminars, we've got some resources by the speakers and uploaded by other people and also the video recordings. Um, so this also enables the building of a network of communities around these events, uh, kind of lifting them out of their unique and in many ways still objectified settings. So for instance, our speakers today, I see resources that Iris has brought into, um, have brought various resources to support their papers, so do make sure to check these out because they kind of accompany the papers too. So this specific seminar on radical methodologies for the post-humanities will focus on some of the methodologies that are questioning the established disciplinary forms, methods, and practices of the humanities, including its underlying humanist values and ethics. It will explore how these emergent methodologies are finding ways of moving beyond the humanist emphasis in the humanities on the individual creative human author, originality, intellectual property, the fixed and finished object, writing and the book, among others. So can we then, as Gary Hall has stated, critically and creatively test, trial, tease, and trouble some of these ideas, rather than being continually dragged back towards the humanities, the digital humanities, or even post-human humanities studies? So how can we extend this critique of humanist modes of inquiry into what can be called a critical post-humanities? So this seminar kind of provides a space for thinking about the other actants, objects, and non-humans that are active in the production, performance, and enactment of research. So in our present increasingly digital academic constellation, who is it that can know? Who or what produces our knowledge? For instance, what does the use of online digital media mean for the way we do research and the way we envision our methods? What are, as Norcia Mares has argued, the changing relations between social research, its devices, and objects in digital online environments. And what role do these devices, methods, technologies, and media, these objects and subjects, play in the way we do research? How do they constitute and mediate its means of production and communication? So for instance, what does it mean when our subjectivities as researchers are no longer perceived as stable and fixed, particular identities, but when we perceive both the researchers and the texts that study, they study as living entities, as co-involving in their search for meaning. So this is, of course, direct consequences for our notions of ethics and responsibility. So how can we reconstitute the field of knowledge through a reassessment and a critique of the production and increasingly complex forms of knowledge in an ongoing ethical and responsible way? How as theorists and philosophers can we perform our research and practices differently, shifting the focus from the commodified objects of our investigations to the processes of knowledge production and human humanities inquiry? And how can we in this process open up to affirmative post-human potentialities, immersed as we are in a technologically mediated and co-evolving world, one that is both the content and context of our investigations? So what can the humanities become in all these entangled constellations?
So for those of you who use Twitter, the hashtag that we will be using during the event is disruptive media. Uh, and you can also use it if you want to ask a question or you want to ask a question to the speakers or one of the panels because I'll be monitoring it during the event. Um, we've also got the program here. So this is the schedule. Uh, there will be two panels with a tea break in between, and you can just grab coffee whenever you want to. It's there in the back, so just go for it. Um, so before I finish this introduction, I will introduce our first speaker, Monica Baca. Uh, I'd like to thank some of the people who've helped us uh, with this event. Uh, first of all, to Greg Codard, who's been helping us with the IT there, and the fantastic students around you that will be recording this for us. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, the members of the Center for Disruptive Media and the Disruptive Media Learning Lab. Uh, and I also want to say that the Disruptive Media Learning Lab is doing a Disruptive Media Learning Expo this Wednesday and Thursday, and when you can subscribe for that, register for that at Eventbrite. So go to dmll.org.uk if you're interested in that. Um, so now to introduce our first speaker, we'll be Skyping in. So. Fingers crossed that will all go well. Uh, this is Monica Bakker, and Monica Bakker is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Adam Mikowitz University in Poznan in Poland. She writes on contemporary art and aesthetics with a particular focus on post-humanist gender and cross-cultural perspectives. The author of two books, Biotransfigurations, Art and Aesthetics of Post-Humanism, 2010 in Polish, and Open Body, 2000, also in Polish. She's the co-author of Pieroma, Pleroma, Art in Search of Fullness, 1989, and editor of Australian Aboriginal Aesthetics, 2004, also in Polish, Going Aerial, Air, Art and Architecture, 2006, and The Life of Air, Dwelling, Communicating, Mapping, 2011. And since 2001, she has been an editor of the Polish cultural journal Czakcz, Kultury, hope I pronounced that correctly, Time of Culture. So, Monica, here you go. Oh, hello. Hello. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and thanks to all those who made this event possible. So I'm going to jump right into my paper, and uh, the title of it is uh, Deep Time Environments, Art, and the Materiality of Life Beyond the Human. And I need the first slide, please, because I don't see the slides, so I hope they're there. Time is uh, an inhuman force, which, as Elizabeth Grosh puts it, has the capacity to hide in objects. These objects may be living and non-living, contemporary and long gone, small as a grain of sand or big as a planet. A planetary perspective on human life vis-a-vis non-human forms brings to attention not only vast spatial dimensions, but also immense temporal dimensions. Human experience, then, is not limited to the living on Earth but actually being Earth, or perhaps, as Rosie Braidotti puts it, becoming Earth, and the temporal dimension of the materiality um, of life opens up a perspective of the coevolution, uh, opens up a perspective of the coevolution of life and environment that is organic and inorganic matter, in complexities and scales way beyond the human, and perhaps even beyond life as we know it. In this talk, I would like to analyze artworks investigating temporal dimensions of life beyond human. I chose artworks which stand on the crossroads of um, art and science, bearing in mind Deleuze's statement that philosophy, art, and science, I quote, come into relations of mutual resonance and exchange, end of quote. Artists Cathy Patterson, Oliver Kelhammer, and Adam Brown, whose work I'm going to present, collaborate with scientists who deal with materiality of life on several different levels and evoke scales which do not comply with human scale, neither on the individual level nor the level of the species. The artwork themselves are specifically situated here and now, and the resonance with the techno-scientific status quo is clear. But as Deleuze points out, it is not monitoring, but impinging and relevance of philosophy, science, and art which counts. I would like to demonstrate then how the specific artworks with their own specific methods of research resonate with the posthumanist attitudes in the inquiry into deep time perspective on life. And I need the second slide, please. 
viewing all bodily lives, including ours, as metabolic processes unfolding in time, as flows of matter and energy, call for recognition of what Katrin Yusuf named the geologic life, postulating to see, I quote, our ways of being as geological rather than biological per se, end of quote. In this context, I would like to discuss Katy Patterson Patterson's artwork, Fossil Necklace, which focuses on materiality of geologic life. The necklace consists of 170 beads made out of carved fossils. The work, however, does not look like a luxury item, but rather resembles an object of contemplation. For non-experts, um, non-expert viewers actually, who certainly wouldn't be able to recognize the fossils and distinguish between the oldest and the youngest specimens, and the time gap may be um, as big as two billion years, the artist provides a descriptive map and a magnifying glass. A second, uh, a third um, slide, please. The careful study is recommended and the viewers can find, themselves, uh, can find names of the fossils as well as the indication of the location where they were found. The oldest bead of the necklace is a fossilized Archaean stromatolite, found in the contemporary South Africa. Stromatolites consist of layers of cyanobacteria, the most ancient life form producing oxygen, which trap minerals from water and build so-called living rocks. And among the youngest fossils of the necklace are bones of a horse from the time of the beginning of agriculture and hippos bones from the Mesopotamian period. And yet, Human fossils, per se, are not part of the necklace. But there are numerous beads made of fossilized organisms contemporary to our close ancestors. Apart from those already mentioned beads relating to the modern homo, there is Kenyan meos and amber being a fossilized resin which relates in time and space to the human chimpanzee divergence um, in East Africa about six, seven million years ago. Coral bead of the Pleistocene, to give another example, relate to the, pros, uh, to the presence of Homo erectus in East Asia. And the fossilized mammoth rib relate to the presence of Neanderthals in Europe. This shows that deep time environments were populated not only, uh, obviously at one point, not only by one, but multiple human ancestors whose traces may be found in DNA of modern humans. Katrin Yusuf points out that, especially with the fossil records of Denisovan, disputed Homo floresiensis, and the sequencing of Neanderthal's DNA, whose genetic material up to 4% got incorporated into modern Euro-Asian genome, the origin of Homo sapiens is not one. I quote, the genus of the human is rapidly becoming articulated as multiply, situated, um, and genetically differentiated, end of quote. And next slide, please. Yet, dealing with fossilized life, we come to immensity of forms and connections, which can only be hinted, as Henry Gee in his book In Search of Deep Time suggests, I quote, fossils, such as fossils of creatures we hail as our ancestors, continue primary evidence for the history of life. But each fossil is an infinitesimal dot lost in fathomless sea of time, whose relationship with other fossils and organisms living in the present day is obscure, end of quote. And because fossils come to existence accidentally and in specific environmental circumstances, we will never have a complete picture of the life long gone. Moreover, fossils, also those included in Patterson's necklace, are not only parts of organisms' actual bodies, because so-called trace fossils are evidences that an organism passed that way. In other words, what we deal with is an element of fossilized environment of the organism. The necklace, then, is a string of things, as Elizabeth Grosh would call them, when she writes, I quote, the thing emerges out of and as substance, it is the coming into existence of prior substance or thing in a new time. The thing, she continues, is a certain carving out of the real, 
the artificial or arbitrary division of real into entities, bounded and contained system, nominal or usable units that exist within the real only as open systems, end of quote. There is then only, not only immensity of time, but also immensity of forms and entanglements of organic and inorganic matter in a constant flow. And the fifth slide, please. Unlike in Patterson's work, where materiality of life of deep time is fossilized, in Oliver Kalhammer's project, neo Eosin, we come to contact with life forms which lived through geologic time, but are still alive, now, and which Charles Darwin called living fossils. Kelhammer's goal is to recreate forests of the Eocene and in this way connect deep past with the future by planting trees such as meta sequoia, sequoia and ginkgo, among others, in the way, sorry, in the area which is now Canada and which they populated in the past as known from fossil records. Eocene is the point of reference here, as it was a geological epoch which started with a dramatic warming of the climate about 55.8 million years ago, when even the polar regions were inhabited by warm weather species of animals and plants. And next slide, please. Kalhammer's project, Neo-Eocene, refers to the changing global conditions, especially global warming. He started it in 1990s in a modest scale in his Cortes Islands yard, and then in 2008, with help of a botanist, Rupert Sheldrake, he extended his experiment to a bigger area on the other side of the same island. With the extended project, an interesting dispute developed with the forestry department concerning a question, what is a native species? A question which is usually related rather to space than time. The artist's opinion, however, brings a new perspective on the issue as he explains that, I quote, native should be expanded to incorporate formerly, even prehistorically, native species, given the distribution of present-day biogeoclimatic zones, and surely like to change. Is, is surely like to change. Kelhammer, with his project Neo-Eocene, creates a possibility, as he says, I quote, to experience the world beyond our own species, comparatively recent dominance of the planet. Explaining that, he continues, looking into the past was one thing. There were rocks and fossils to serve as clues for what had happened, but what about the future, he asked. With the global warming, the future may belong to those species which have already proved to be able to deal with similar conditions. Moreover, as recent studies suggest, plants are more resilient to events leading to extinction than animals. The metasequoia or dawn, or dawn redwood, as it is called, being one of Kelhammer's botanical choices, is among the greatest botanical finds of the 20th century. It had been believed to be extinct until 1940s, and until then had been known only from the fossils. It turned out, however, that a small population of these trees survived in the forests of central China. Similarly, a small population of ginkgo trees survived in another part of China and has been revived by Buddhist monks who cultivated them in their gardens. In anticipation of significant global warming, the artist wants to bring back these trees to the northern environments on the premise that as these species were prevalent during the Eocene, thermal maximum, they might be suited for the hot climate to come. Not only that they pr proved to be very adaptable, but also they may be those who could take over territories vacated by species which will go extinct. And uh, I hope we have the slide number seven on or up. This is what I need. Yet the future climate and its impact on Kelhammer's young forest of deep time, partially consisting of living fossils, is impossible to predict. The Neo-Eocene is unknown, but as 
The name Eocene, coined in 1833 by Charles Lyell and derived from the Greek words Eos, meaning dawn, and Kainos, meaning recent, the Neo-Eocene similarly is not viewed in catastrophic terms, but possibly as a new dawn as well. As the biologist Daniel Silvestro suggests, I quote, in the plant kingdom, mass extinction events can be seen as opportunities for turnover leading to renown, renowned biodiversity, end of quote. And now uh, slide number seven, please. Another anticipated version of the dawn, of a new dawn, actually, which is well grounded in deep time, is offered by artist Adam Brown in his work Rebiogenesis, Origins of Life. This project, as he says, consists of, um, I quote, extreme minimal ecosystems capable of the autopoetic evolution of prebiotic chemistries capable of attaining life. End of quote. Like Kelhammer's forest, Brown's project is performative. It is not representing the new beginning or new beginnings, but actually the artist makes an attempt for a reenactment of it. As the curator uh, Inke Arms states, I quote, artistic reenactments do not simply affirm what has happened in the past, but question the present by taking recourse to historical events that have left their traces in collective memory. End of quote. In case of Brown's reenactment of Origins of Life, collective memory may at best be located in organic and non-organic things, materialities of the living and the non-living, non-human rather than human. This could be memory of water, rocks, and plants, as discussed mm -hmm. by Bronisław Szerszyński. The enactment of an event of the non-human past only partially belongs to the natural history because it is based on human understanding of such processes and utilizing lab equipment. However, once the process is set up, it continues by the means of its own inhuman forces. And yet, even if life emerges in rebiogenesis experiment, it may neither be noticed, nor surviving for long. So I hope you are watching the video as a background to what I'm talking about, because I really want to underline the fact that um, rebiogenesis is, uh, has this um, um, element of reenactment. It's not an object, but a process. But what does it really mean, then, to posit the question of origins of life? Elizabeth Grosch, critically speaking about origin in Darwinian context, points out that the origin, I quote, is in a certain sense impossible to understand as a locatable or knowable entity, a definite point in time, a single chemical reaction, for it is an origin that is not one, that is always already implicated in multiplicity of difference, in a constellation of transformations, an event that imperceptibly affects everything, end of quote. Contemporary research suggests that life may have originated in more than one location, hence the chemical and physical contingencies may have been different, leading to the emergence of life dwelling, sorry, emergence of other life dwelling in conditions unsuitable for carbon-based life, and therefore not in competition with it, or possibly not familiar life, is in a symbiotic relation with others, but has yet not been recognized as such. Again, there is really no reason to believe that we, the carbon life forms, are alone. And this concerns not only outer space, but also, and perhaps more importantly, our local habitat, the planet. With the abundance of existing matter, we cannot exclude other options. As Jane Bennett points out, I quote, if we think we already know what is out there, we will almost surely miss much of it, end of quote. We cannot exclude the possibility that life emerged more than once on Earth and in forms other than that represented by ourselves. 
However, life based on a different principle may be very difficult to recognize. So it may already be around us, and we simply do not know what to look for. In concluding, I would like to underline that art inquiries into planetary environments investigating, investigated in terms of deep time actually offer reconsideration of our own position as a species and as carbon life forms and open up yet another way to look into the future of the planet. Fossils, living fossils, minerals and organic matter show what Delanda explains writing that, I quote, over the millennia it is the flow of biomass through food webs as well as flow of genes through generations that matters, not the bodies and species that emerge from these flows, end of quote. However, in our own scale, the scale of individuals and species entangled in food webs, autotrophic and heterotrophic metabolic systems, rearticulating materiality in ways not yet fully comprehended and not, and not fully predictable, we need to reconsider our views on subjectivity and our ways of belonging to inhuman forces and tentative materialities. Because, as Grosch points out, I quote, it is matter, the thing that produces life, sustains and provides life with its biological organization and orientation, and it requires life to overcome itself, to evolve, to become more. End of quote. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We could see everything very well, so it went really well. I'd like to introduce Leslie now. So, Leslie Gourlay is Senior Lecturer in Contemporary Literacies in the Department of Culture, Communication and Media at UCL Institute of Education. Her background is in applied linguistics, and her current research interests include academic textual practices, post-human and social material perspectives on higher education, and the implications of digital mediation for the contemporary university. Fascinating um, talk to follow. I'm afraid mine is, is rather more... Um related to the day-to-day the -day, um, world of the university, but I hope I can make some connections in terms of um, some of the points being made about materiality in particular. Okay, so um, yeah, as uh, Janneke said, I'm, I'm from UCL Institute of Education, and I'll just crack on because we don't have a lot of time. That's my title. I'm not, I don't know how, how far I'll get. I've got a few little bits and pieces to talk about, so if I, oops, if I don't finish them all, then I'll... I'll, I'll get as far as I can with it, uh, in because I'm reporting on a, an empirical project as well as trying to make some points uh, in terms of theory. I want to start with a, this um, quote from Cathy, Cathy Kell, which I really like. Cathy Kell works in, um, she's a linguistic ethnographer, and one of the points she makes is that modes and media of communication carry meanings oh. between streams and flows that make up the texture of the contemporary world, and historically, Literacy is one of the most important channels through which meanings have crossed space and time. And I think this is a really important point, which has been badly neglected in um, literacy studies and also in um, higher education studies more broadly. And I suppose that one of my kind of attempts that I want to make with my work is to try to draw some connections across those, those um, gaps, I guess. Um, you'll be very familiar, I'm sure, this audience with, with the work of Catherine Hales. particularly loved this, uh, her latest book where she makes the point that the age of print is passing and the assumptions, presuppositions and practices associated with it are now becoming visible as media-specific practices rather than the largely invisible status quo. Now, actually, I, I, I kind of agree with that up to a point, but one of the, some of the data that I want to um, draw on today but I think actually does question that, and one of the points I want to make is sort of touches on the kind of what I would call the sort of persistence of print literacy artefacts in the digital. I think they're, they're, they're not really... Um, it's not really possible to draw them apart. Anyway, a quick point I want to make is um, one of the sort of base points of my work draws on um, new literacy studies, which came out of social anthropology in the 80s. Um, briefly, this area of work was, was quite important in terms of textual studies in, in the university because it was one of the first areas of um, theoretical development which questioned the, the notion of literacy as a kind of cognitive category of um, you know, residing in the individual and instead it, it talks about literacy as um, socially situated practice 
and there's a, there's a rich body of literature out there which I don't have time to get into today, but that's kind of my first theoretical kind of stepping stone that I want to make. Um, the notion that, that literacy is, is always situated and it's always... Yeah, that body of work talks about it being socially situated, but not materially situated. So I suppose that's one of the points that I really want to make today is that um, one of the, I think the, the kind of missing points in that, in that area of work is um, attention to the material and the, uh, the materiality of and the embodied set of practices that the fine grained granularity of those practices as they're, they're, they unfold in in the day to day in this image and many of the others that I, I'm using come from a um, one year longitudinal study that I undertook with my colleague um, Martin Oliver at the Institute where we gave students um, handheld devices and asked them to take images and videos of their interaction with technologies and texts um, in the day to day. We see a lot of these images of um, and the students were given very very loose guidance and these kind of um, points came back which were the, the, the basis of the interviews that we did, a lot of focus on um, the very particular embodied practices of reading, and, and very often surrounded by, by artefacts and, and, and objects related to the biological, eat, eating, drinking, sitting, um, being in the sunshine, looking at the squirrels. Um, this particular student made me this slide, among others, um, and she came up with that. And, you know, I, don't, I wasn't feeding her lines about spatiality and so on. I mean, this was something that she, she came up with. And I think it's a fascinating little set of, of images that, that, she, that she produced. And I'll come back to one of them in a minute. But just going back to the, the, the way that the field was developing at the time, um, I would argue that we have um, new literacy studies starting to recognise the situated nature of, of textualities. And meanwhile, um, in educational technology, there, there was a, a, an increasing recognition of, um, well, the, the complexities of day-to-day -day student practice. But then again, separately in, um, in semiotics, we had a whole body of work around multimodality and the importance of the screen. So one of the points I want to make is that these three sets of um, sort of academic endeavours, I suppose, weren't really talking to each other very much, but I think they're really interrelated. Um, I'm sure you're already quite familiar with some of the work of people like Gunter Kress, um, drawing out the, the importance of, of image-based semiotic resources and how really there is no such thing as a straightforward um, linguistic text. Um, some of the images in, in the data um, are, I think, underline that point. Um, this, is, this comes from one of the uh, faculty. Um, so one of the things we did in our, our, our research project was ask people to do um, like sort of maps and, and diagrams of their day-to-day -day practice, and this is an example of that. So there's a large body of work um, drawing on these qualitative methodologies, but they need to be brought together, I would argue, into um, drawing on the best of the, this work to, to try to understand what social actors are doing in the day-to-day -day and how this, these, this, these meaning-making practices actually unfold. Um, I love that. I, I, could, I could talk for 20 minutes about that, <laughs> but better not. Um, and of course, um, one of the points I would make, as I'm sure my, my co-speakers um, will be making similar points, is that in, in all of these analyses, the, the role of, um, the, of objects has been elided. You know, the sort of like the central um, importance of, of artifacts of, 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 of communication and digital and literacies more generally and textuality have not been attended to particularly well. Um, drawing on Latour, um, you, you'll be very familiar with, I'm sure, but you know, I always go back to Latour for this, that the, the standard paradigm of social science, the objects are not seen as, the, as part of the social, um, but instead they're seen as a sort of backcloth or, or context for, or, or a set of tools. And I think there's a particular problem in um, educational technology where, the, where the, the discourse of tools is extremely strong. And the notion of the, 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 the binary of tool and user in particular is very problematic. And one of the points I would argue as well is that um, the, the theoretical work about semiotic, semiotic practice in text has, has tended to elide the role of, of non-human actors when in fact they've been extremely central. Um, media theorists such as Kittler, of course, um, 
has um, uh, reminded us of the, of the centrality of, of, of that in, in media systems and the university in particular and the, the way that the non-human actors have repositioned social actors um, over the centuries. Luther's quote, which we all, you'll know very well, I'm sure, but I, I love this one all the same, as if a damning curse had been cast onto things. You could only be Luther, <laughs> couldn't it? Right, like that. And they remain asleep like the servants of some enchanted castle. It's like something of a toy story. <laughs> but they start shuddering and stretching and muttering. But I love this whole thing about the sort of reanimation of, of, of the, of the, of the non-human. But I think theoretically it's a really important point as well. Um, waking them out of their dogmatic sleep. Very importantly, um, I don't have a quote for this, but I think it's an important point to make that from Latour is um, his, his distinction in 2005 between um, social actors which are intermediaries or those that are mediators, and he argues that an intermediary is um, that which um, transports meaning or force without its transformation, defining its inputs is enough to define its outputs, while mediators transform, translate, distort and modify the meaning of the elements they're supposed to carry. This is a really important point I want to make. He's drawing on actor network theory here and talking about um, social actors, human and non-human, primarily and predominantly as mediators, and he argues that intermediaries, intermediaries are rare, but mediators are common. I think this has got something to tell us in terms of, you know, an analysis of, of, of um, meaning making in the university. Hales, in the post oh, this is ancient, but it's worth throwing it in. Um, I won't read it, but yeah, I suppose that's, that's one of the points I want to, one of my important starting points as well. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just crack on. I'm sorry I'm going quite quickly. But I want to talk a little bit, <laughs> I love that picture, about, about distributed authorship. It's just an excuse to show a fox with a pen, really. But, um, but I think one of the things that I think is very interesting about Hales's conception of, of the post-human when applied to or attempted to apply to textualities and literacy practices is it does call into question assumptions about the nature and the identity of the, 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 the quote-unquote author who is traditionally seen as a sort of stable and singular human individual. Um, but I would argue in the context of the contemporary university where most reading and writing takes place via digital devices or in a digitally saturated environment, um, it could be argued that the authorship is, is really um, radically and irrevocably distributed between human machine and, and the distributed agency of internet-based texts um, in the way that they, they act and actively contribute towards um, the process of authorship. So, so I think it's very difficult to consider the notion of the, of the, the single um, autonomous author um, really in any context. I mean, okay, we've always had intertextuality, this isn't a new idea. But I do think there's a qualitative difference when you introduce the digital in terms of the, the sheer volume and complexity of, 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 of textual agency that's involved. Um, Hales um, looks at this in her 2012 book and she looks particularly at, at the effects of digital devices on student writing practices. It's very readable if you haven't looked at it already, it's a great book. She points out, but she talks about screen reading um, being on the increase in print reading on the decline. Um, but in her earlier work, she also in insists on a sort of recognition of the embodied and intermeshed nature of the relationship with digital media. So we're not talking about a kind of rarefied um, vision, Brave New World vision of, 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 of the digital engagement with the digital being, um, in some sense, um, disembodied. Instead, this is a bit long, but it's worth picking a couple of points out here. Our interactions with digital media are embodied. They have bodily effects at the physical level. The actions of computers are also embodied, although they're a very different manner. I like the middle part there. The more one works with, the dig with digital technologies, the more one comes to appreciate the capacity of networks and programmable machines to carry out da -da -da, the extension of one's thoughts rather than the external. So it's the notion of the prosthesis. Again, embodiment takes the form of extended co cognition. I'm not going to get into the cognition thing, but I think Hales, again, is coming back to what she talked about in her earlier work as um, embodied um, virtuality. So, so the whole thing about um, and recognition of, of the permeation of the digital without collapsing into a binary of um, embodied versus disembodied, which I think is really important. 
And if we take it back to the university, we can see how, um, how, how this plays itself out. Now I'm going to talk a little bit, I won't have time to talk in too much detail, but we did a, 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 a the study I mentioned. That's a little overview of some of the methodology that we use. This was JISC funded. This is a government agency which gave us some money to do this. Um, and we, we did a, a sort of set of different um, types of in investigations into student experiences. These were um, postgraduate students. Um, I won't go into the, the detail of the methodology too much. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the data in terms of um, Hales. I want to sort of try to link some of this stuff um, to some of Hales's ideas. Um, three, three points, I might just manage to, I'll see how I get on. But one, the first one I want to draw out is, is this statement where Hills says, materiality, like the object itself, is not a pre-given entity, but rather a dynamic process that changes as the focus, focus of attention shifts. So again, this notion of it's not sort of a priori kind of back cloth to, to social action, but it's something which is constantly emergent. The materiality itself is always unfolding. Um, in the data, we have um, some nice little pictures. And this is Sally. I asked Sally to, to draw me a picture in the interview. This wasn't pre-prepared, but she drew it out for me in the interview of her day-to-day -day life at the university and how she works with technologies. And this is Sally in the middle, running around between the train, various buildings, and she's got the VLE, and she's got internet, and public transport, and all sorts of things. Um, and I think there's a really strong sense of, obviously, spatial distribution um, and a sort of very complex set of interlocking material and digital domains of practice. And this is just one student, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, Juan um, depicted his flat. And Juan's flat, he's drawn a line between home and university, but there's actually different areas of his house. So, like, is, I, think, I think the bedroom is, is off limits. He doesn't take his laptop <coughs> in there, but he always will do with his university stuff in, in, the, in the rest of the house. Um, so there's quite a lot of evidence in the data of students' attempts to kind of, I suppose, in, inter, intervene their agency with, with this sense of, like, kind of permeation and try to sort of work with it. And, 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 and again, this notion that the materiality of their... Their, their network and how they were engaging with meaning making was always emergent. Like Juan was always sort of thinking, this was something that had to be worked on. It wasn't something which just was just a given. It was it was always worked upon. Yuki, one of the other students, said, well, I won't read through it, but you can skim it and see that she's talking quite a lot about the really curation. I mean, she her whole. Um, relationship with, with, I think, technologies and, and sort of meaning-making practices generally was about curation and, and recording and portability in particular. And she, her, her iPad was very, very important to her. Uh, as we can see here, when she, she told me in the data about, in her interview about um, putting her iPod in a Ziploc bag and reading it in the bath. So um, she, was, she was so keen on using it. Um, this piece of technology. But I think this is actually quite interesting because it's kind of like, going back to Latour, there's, the iPad is a mediator here instead of an intermediary. Um, it changes the meaning of what's happening and it becomes a sort of trans-contextual um, object where the, the, the bath, which is like we normally associate with intimacy, personal space, becomes permeated, becomes a link, linked out and linked into the sort of almost infinite world of, of networks. Um, texts and devices. So it's coming back to Hale's, this notion of the, the changing assemblage, you know, that um, you can, just by the introduction of this device and the use of it, it transforms, I would argue, the, what we might conventionally see as the context of the bathroom. I think the bathroom and the bath and everything in it and, um, is, is part of an emergent network of, um, of material practice. How am I doing? Okay. Another long one, but let's just pick out the important points. So Hales is talking about time scales of human cognition and intelligent machines requires a theoretical framework where objects are seen not as static entities, the ones created remain the same, but are understood as constantly changing assemblages in which inequalities and inefficiencies in their operations drive them towards breakdown and so on. Objects in this view are more like technical individuals enmeshed in networks of social 
economic and technological relations, some of which are human and some non-human. Um, so the objects themselves are not, are not static either. They're not an unchanging reference point around which the, the social revolves, but instead they are themselves, particularly the digital, because, the, you know, the, okay, the sort of physical materiality of an, of an iPad may be relatively stable, but what the iPad is is in constant flux in terms of apps and, and changes that the user might be making to it, and the changes that it makes to itself constantly. So, um, looking at some of the examples of this, Juan says, um, his favourite way of studying is sitting down with a book and a pen and some yellow paper, and he means like post-its. Um, you know, international students who didn't know the word post-it, but uh, I like combining the two, the demarcation lines between them. Remember, he's the guy with the flat and it's got a demarcation line in the middle. Um, and this is my point I was trying to make earlier, that the, the Juan's practice is maximising the degree to which he can materially interact with the text. Um, so highlighter pen becomes a mediator in Latour's terms as well, and so does the, the post-it note. Um, so I think this starts. This type of practice disrupts the notion of the, the sort of strong binary of um, digital and, and print literacy practice. Um, we have lots of examples in the data of people that making quite a lot of trouble to print things off and use highlighter pens and write notes in the margins. And I, I think that it's, there's more to that than just a, a sort of harking back to the, the pre-digital set of practices, but I think there is, it's, it's about the, 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 the maximising the deployment of mediators and intervention with the text um, through these objects, these print literacy artefacts. Okay, I'm going to do one more, and this is a bit complicated, but this is one as well, because he asked me to, I asked him to tell me all about when he wrote an essay. I don't know if you can say much of that you can read, but there's, you can get the gist, hopefully, that he, he's made a, a set of sort of flowchart thing, um, showing how he, he wrote his essay, right? And, but I think this is an absolute masterpiece as far as I'm concerned. About it. Because it, if we're talking about the notion of the constantly changing assemblage, the complex interplay of print and digital, then it's all there, you know, the, the, the back and forward, that he's broken it down. I didn't have to go out and do an ethnography with this guy because he was doing it about his own practice. And you can see how the different stages go back and forward, handwritten notes, organised notes. He even put some videos in showing himself with his hands and with, with, with um, objects. So well, I suppose really moving to a conclusion, what we see is the absence of what Latour would call the, 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 the neutral intermediary. It's quite striking. Instead, all the devices and the artefacts um, appear to exhibit the features of the mediator. They're changing and transforming texts as they interact with them. I think this underscores Latour's contention that, that media intermediaries are rare, non-human actors are agentive in social pro um, process. They're, they're not tools, um, but they're actually transformative sort of boundary objects which are being used um, to transform not only the text, but also the, 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 the social actors themselves are transformed in interaction with them. Like humans, objects also have their embodiments, and embodiments matter no less than for humans. When objects acquire sensors and actuators, it is no exaggeration to say they have an umwelt in the sense that they perceive the world, draw conclusions based on their perceptions, and act on their perceptions. And my final point, which I can, I'm just going to squeeze in in the last five minutes, was um, a strand of work which we hadn't anticipated and we didn't put in research questions, but which came out. It was quite a, and I wish I'd made more of it now in the data. Maybe I'll get some <laughs> funding to do another project and try and do some more about this, about the, the relationships people had with their devices. Um, you can see some quotes here. I mean, I won't go read them through, but you can, I think you get the, 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 the feeling of it there, the, you know, the notion of the, the cute little computer touching my laptop. UK in particular, I think the very, very intimate. She was the one with the iPod in the bath. Um, Nahid with his laptop as a constant companion. And he had a long story about going on long um, distance buses in Bangladesh with his, with his laptop as his companion, but also the, the, the laptop became an important symbolic object for him, it seemed to me, um, where it signified other things beyond simply a, a writing device. Um, and the third half of my brain is Giggle Scholar, which I just love, it. that's brilliant. Um, and Django. 
talking about her use of, of digital um, devices, even uses the, the term circuit, which I thought was very, very interesting that she, that she just came up with that. So just to conclude, I think what we see in this data is that the objects are presented are not presented as tools which carry previously formulated stable meanings, as in Latour's notion of the intermediary. Instead, Latour's notion of the mediator was deployed throughout the analysis to characterise the agentive meaning-making and transformative nature of these objects, um, which we, I think we see in the, in the student accounts. And I suppose my contention in this paper is that a recognition of objects as agentive mediators as opposed to intermediaries offers a sort of transcontextual analysis and um, new analytical purchase on how we understand these kind of fine-grained um, analyses of micro practices through which texts are, are generated and transformed. Um, the, the devices appear to be implicitly understood by students as social actors. The students haven't come across um, actor network theory or post-human theory, but it seemed to me that the, the statements that they made uh, suggested that there was a sense in which they, they regarded them as agentive. And I didn't have time to show you, there's a lot of other data about um, the spy in your pocket and people feeling like um, that they had to protect themselves against surveillance with digital um, technology as well. However, um, as I said, they're, they're rich in social signification. They're capable of creating meaning, um, but also we, we see this persistence of the, of the, 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 the the artefacts such as the pen, the paper, the, the post-it note, um, the, the means by which people can sort of physically, um, in an embodied way, intervene with texts. Um, and even when there, 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 there's little apps and things they could use instead, it seems like people were, were, were drawn towards doing that. So again, they don't seem to be neutral, passive objects, but more agentive actors, creatively enrolled in the processes of um, text production. So I suppose my, my final conclusion, unsurprisingly, is that this, this blurs the comments, as I think you know, Yannick has already set out in, the, in the, um, the, the framing of this whole series, is, but I think this project maybe kind of underlines this, that common sense binaries around um, supposed um, divisions between the text, the author, the human, the device, and the text and the context, I think are very, very um, seriously undermined by a closer analysis of how um, texts are produced and um, interacted with. And I've referred to the university, but I think that has um, relevance beyond that context as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. So we've got some time until we have a break for questions. So I know you're all dying to ask something to either Monica or Leslie after their fantastic talk. So who would like to ask something? And Ye will help us out with... Uh, Please speak into the, into the microphone if you can. Some questions. In the back. Um, hello, thank you very much for um, some really interesting talks. My question was to, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Leslie. <laughs> sorry. Leslie? Leslie. Um, I was wondering about, because you were talking quite a lot about the data having that sense of being very intimate. And I was wondering whether there was anything in the um, methods that you were using that was looking for some kind of sensory as well as this idea of the material um, or the materiality, because that image at the beginning with the book and the sunshine and, and that feeling of being in the park with a book and then the idea of using the iPad in the bath in that intimate space and then the headphones as well also made me think or wonder if there was any attempt to grasp that kind of sensory data. Well, I mean, I think um, when we started, my, um, I deliberately chose a methodology which was visual, because I wanted to circumvent um, traditional account data. You know, because in, in my experience, asking people to tell me how they interact with things or how they, get, how they do things, generally, I think very often leads to very bland data where people just say, oh yeah, it's fine, or oh, I'm not very good at 
technology we or something like that. So I wanted to sort of find a way of anchoring data in the day to day. And so I'd used visual methodologies before, like photography and video. Um, but I suppose primarily I was thinking of it as a sort of heuristic, you know, I was thinking it's a way to kind of like just give us something to talk about that the student, that the participant brings. So I think it's a really good question because I think what actually happened was that, um, and in a way it made, I think it, it, it felt more, in some respects more, more significant because it just, it really did just emerge from the, from the participants. I didn't particularly go out looking for accounts of maybe the slightly more sort of um, embodied experiences, like you say. I mean, I think I, I, I kind of, I was more at the beginning more, because we did four interviews or three interviews with each person over a year. And at the beginning I was all about, okay, so tell me what this image means, using them almost as tokens. And I think actually I, I started to see that it was more than that and that people were using images to actually find a way of talking about um, other types of embodiment. And I think methodologically, I suppose, drawing on the, 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 the whole theme of the seminar series, I mean, I think, I, I, I personally, I think um, multimodal methodologies are quite suitable for um, sort of post-human study, as it were, because I think they take us away from textualising, you know, which well, most social science basically just makes more text, which is fine if we recognise that, but I think... And I was making more text as well, but I was trying to use something else as a sort of disruptive moment in that textual sort of like chain. So maybe, I mean, the next thing I have to think about is what do you do to kind of structure the, the data collection to allow for that even more clearly? Because I think when you go around, sort of, it's the sort of thing that has to almost kind of creep up on you. I think directly asking people about stuff like that doesn't work very well. It's, you have to almost have to do it a bit more obliquely. I don't know, what do you think? I mean, do you think there's a way of kind of opening up, let's say, a, a study like that to, to bring out that data even better? Well, I think, I think I'm, I'm thinking of it particularly in terms of Dr. Sir. Um, <laughs> I can hear you, fine. Um, a PhD student, Francine, <laughs> okay. who's, who's doing work on, on bridal culture and the, um, the amount of data that she's getting from participants on the basis of those visual images is... is I could kind of see crossovers. I could also see crossovers with um, that kind of sense that the intimate has, has reached every single part of our life. So even education has to be understood in very, very oh, intimate absolutely. terms. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And also that, um, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, a sort of a, a visceral quality mm -hmm. to, to the, the data, especially if it's generated by the students themselves. And I was worked really hard to tell them they didn't have to bring pretty pictures because you know they weren't. It wasn't an art project because some of them got worried about that. You know they thought they had to make it look really great. And once they got past that, I think it, there's an immediacy about about that and an emotional aspect. I mean, sometimes interviews could get quite emotional as well. Something to do with the fact that there was this image, and often the images were taken from very intimate settings. We saw the bath. There was all the bedrooms and. Places where you wouldn't normally take a picture and then show it to someone you don't know very well and talk about it. So there's something about it. And also I think it let them control the degree of, of revelation that they wanted to be comfortable with, I suppose, because they chose the image. So yeah, it's really interesting. It sounds like there's some interesting work going on with your student there as well. Thank you. Um, I really liked how the two papers talked to one another because I think Monica's paper really was, um, in your terminology, an example of ecological literacy. I remember uh, when um, Niam and I were at the summer at this particular summer school. I listed like all the different definitions of literacy, so like writing, and, and there's all these like media literacy, but there's also ecological literacy. So I, I well, the summer school was about nature cultures. So I, I really liked that kind of, yeah, combination. And then um, when it comes to Monica's presentation, what I, what I also really appreciated about your presentation and also how you presented the artworks was um, simply, I mean, I'm looking at the screen, I don't know, maybe I should look at the camera instead, but um, was how it complicated 
the the notion of Anthropocene. It's it's really a, I don't think that this notion was in your paper, but it is so much around as a as a notion. And what I really appreciated is how your your talk basically complexified both the anthropos of Anthropocene and also the scene kind of of, of Anthropocene because I think what you complicated was both when was the human just a human so that's more the anthropos part of of the anthropocene but also when is a is an is a new era truly new i mean i i thought that you really showed quite well like for example how the trees can anticipate global warming that was really a beautiful example of how these eras are never stable and 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 static so i don't know it's more like a comment but I really appreciated that. Well, I, I thank you very much. And indeed, uh, it was not only where it's not only about us at the beginning. It's not one, but uh, and that refers to species. That be, uh, refers to individuals, but also to life itself. I mean, the life as we know it. This is also not one. I mean, as we know now, and and we know so little. And when we dig in in some ways, right, in this geological strata, uh, we actually, um, well, we see our lack of knowledge about all these things, but also um, it's not only about just putting it all together as a past events, but actually as events um, that are happening as a process all the time. I mean, there's this continuation. It's not that past is past. Actually, what what it's past, it's also now in the future, and that Anthropocene is also part of that. I didn't have time to elaborate on it, but um, I mean, but obviously I could, but also I want to say that um, um, I'm totally thankful to all these artists. They bring these ideas in, I mean, into the humanities, and I'm a scholar of humanities, but uh, thanks to them, and this is also uh, um, a note on methodologies, uh, one can see uh, something in a different way, and also actually the way they work on these topics is different. They work actually with materialities. They actually show how to do things with things, not with words, right? So I think this is absolutely um, fascinating and something to uh, attend to. So thanks. Hi, uh, this question is for uh, Monica again. Um, it's about the uh, Meta Sequoia project. I, f I forget the name of the artist, but um, what I'm wondering is, I was wondering about the project that he's doing of reintroducing the species, you know, not bringing it in through space, but through time. I was wondering about the relationship between that project and sort of climate change politics, because it, it, it seems to be suggesting that, well, climate change is just gonna happen. There's nothing we can do. It's irreversible, so we might as well just start reintroducing plants that can handle it. And so I, wh what I'm wondering is if there's a danger in this, a kind of like post-humanism of sort of depoliticizing um, some of these sort of activities. I mean, I mean, again, I would say, I mean, in some ways, it's the same sort of amb ambiguity around the Anthropocene in that, ironically, um, by introducing... Uh, human activity into a phase of geological history, it can, it can in terms, translate it into kind of like geological fatalism. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, question. Um, I can only uh, speak about my reading of this specific artwork. I'm not going to talk uh, for um, um, Oliver. Um, and um, I wanted to bring up a specific aspect of this work. And uh, as I hope I pointed out that I wanted to see this very broad perspective time-wise. But obviously, um, your question is, is totally important. Um, how I see it present in this artwork is that um, we cannot really exclude ourselves as a species from, uh, from the planet because we are already here. Uh, so what we can do is to um, somehow um, welcome or um, make 
um, proliferation of um, or provide for proliferation of uh, non-human species. And what um, um, Oliver Kalhammer is, uh, Kalhammer is talking about uh, is that um, obviously this is human intervention into environment. Uh, and this is obviously also an art project, right? But uh, this raises questions of, uh, of human intervention, not only in such a um, welcoming for non-human species um, um, way, I mean, many uh, ways that we um, work with the environments are, are not of that sort. Um, but it's not, I, my reading of this work is not that it is um, um, sort of against any political action, but it's uh, more, uh, as I already said, um, acknowledging that we are part of the, uh, of the whole setup that we live on. Uh, we're in all this together, as other people already said. So um, um, this is what we actually can do. Um, and um, it's better to plant trees than uh, cut trees. And how to plant them is another question of, of this project. And who, uh, when, and what, what species will be there in the future? So it all raises these kind of questions. It is not uh, an, an art project which um, answers all the uh, Anthropocene questions. It just uh, focuses on, on some of them. More question before we have a break? Anybody? Can I ask something about ethics in connection to this? Because I think it's quite interesting to see how both you, you kind of both discuss um, new kinds of methodologies, both in an art context and within a digital literacy context, um, in which you're trying to reconfigure through your use of methodologies and the artists, in your case, through their use of methodologies, um, how we perceive the world and how we interact with it. And you then again try to perceive that as an investigator or in your discussion about the artworks. Um, do you feel that this is a different relationship you have then? How do you position yourself inside or outside that? And what kind of, how do you deal with that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah cool. I mean, I, I think that's such a good question because obviously you, you, you find yourself in a sort of post-human hall of mirrors, which is fine. But, um, you know, because the, 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 um, the research project itself is, is an emergent network of agency and... Um, and, and that's very interesting, and I think that's, that's okay. I think, in, in a sense, you accept that and you work with that within its own terms. But I suppose one of the things I was trying to do with it was um, grant as much direction as possible to the participants. It wasn't attempting to be participatory action research or anything like that. I wasn't trying to do that. I, I took responsibility for the analysis. But, um, but I think it, th th that kind of shared meaning-making in a sense, methodologically reflected the analytical framework. Um, but it was only really through doing it that I started to see that properly because I didn't really know what was going to happen. If I was doing it again, I would do it a little bit differently. Um, it's very, very messy. It generates an awful lot of data. And, and so I, I would probably just make it slightly more structured, but I wouldn't take anything away from the, the role of the participants. I mean, in terms of ethics, um, I mean, image data is fraught with ethical considerations. You have to be so careful about what they can take images of and not obviously of others without consent. Um, so that restricts things. And actually, in a way, it sort of directs you towards the, the non-human actors quite strongly as well, because people are, you're told, oh, don't go around snapping people in the street, you know, so <laughs> they find themselves taking pictures of, of objects. Um, yeah, I mean, I had even, you know, I had informed consent to use all the images. There was some of the images I, I didn't think it was, I still had to exercise my judgment about whether it was ethically acceptable to use some of them. Some of them were so intimate, and there was so much disclosure involved, that even though I had informed consent, I didn't use some images and some, some of the quotes from the interviews, because I just felt like it was, potent, not for publication, maybe for a conference or something, but not for an actual publication, because I think, but I suppose you could say the same for a lot of, social science type data. But um, I think there was something about this that was quite, quite visceral, quite raw sometimes. So I think, yeah, I think it does require a kind of 
a vigilance around data and ethics, um, the, the other sort of textualising, and again I said before about the way that empirical work often textualises, and I think as a result it, it, it renders the, the human subject invisible, and I think there's something about these images that, that keeps the subject quite present. And I think that's, that's a, both a strength and also a vulnerability in terms of ethics. And that's in your description of the artworks, in a way, and how you become part of the of the life and being that they try to enact, maybe, if that makes any sense. Well, maybe just a couple words about this um, question of ethics. Um, I'm, I think that uh, um, non-anthropocentric ethics that would actually involve also um, non-organic beings, um, or life, which is not non-organic, that we don't know yet, um, or will never know. Um, it's it's incredibly challenging, and we're only uh, starting to sort of touch it. And this is a process uh, that um, it's going to bring lots of surprises, I believe. And uh, I think one of the most challenging things, and I, I think it comes uh, out somehow clearly um, in, in the art world, uh, is that it is incredibly difficult to um, somehow um, maintain the difference, the human-non-human difference, without really fetishizing it. And how to deal with this problem is one of the main um, interests of mine these days. And um, I believe we, we have to keep trying. We, it's, this is kind of ethics that, uh, in, in this case, I'll follow Donna Haraway that says this is an ethics in a sense of curiosity and that we know um, more at the end of the day than we knew it in the morning. But it's not a definite thing we are going to uh, achieve anytime soon. Um, so maybe this is not an incredibly optimistic um, answer, but I, I believe that we have to keep trying, and we have to keep trying using different means. Um, and uh, in this case, um, art is, is one of these um, possibilities. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to say thank you again to Leslie and Monica for fantastic <laughs> talks. Okay, I'd like to introduce Nia Moore, so next speaker. So Nia Moore is a Chancellor's Fellow in Sociology at the University of Edinburgh, where her work is centrally concerned with re-envisioning an eco-feminist politics of sustainability. So her background is in interdisciplinary feminist studies and she works across many fields, so the social sciences and the humanities, as well as involving peace camps, allotments, and an LGBT youth group. So she has a forthcoming book, The Changing Nature of Eco-Feminist Politics, telling stories from Cliocot Sound, is that okay? Vancouver, um, UBC Press, and it will be out in April of 2015. So there you go. Mm, thanks. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. So first of all, just thanks to Yannicka for the invite. It's great to um, be here. This is kind of right up my street. And um, I guess having an interdisciplinary background, I love this experience. I've been in a room. We're all kind of talking about the same thing while we're all also talking about very different things at the same time. So to dive straight um, in... Um, what I want to do today, and I forgot, I'm, oh yeah, I'm in charge of my slides, haven't I? <laughs> um, um, what I want to do in terms of thinking about radical methodologies for the post-humanities is to turn to what might seem um, like a humanist method and think, how might we rethink this um, for the post-humanities? <clears throat> so I'm specifically talking um, about oral history, but to some extent because my work straddles um, social sciences and humanities. So I'm thinking oral history, life stories, and inter interview, really, um, in a way, as well. And so, um, yeah. And so we've already had, I suppose, in Leslie's talk, this kind of question of um, these kinds of, yeah, discourse-based methods, and then that are kind of turned into kind of transcripts and texts. And, um, and um, I suppose we're in a context where is, there is this debate about, um, you know, do we need to use new sensory methods or new kinds of methods in order to access something that we might now be calling the post-humanities? So it's in this context, I suppose, that I'm trying to raise this question of, can we retrieve anything <clears throat> from these kind of currently slightly objected methods, I think? Um, <clears throat> and... Um, 
And I suppose I'm particularly focused on oral history, partly because of the project that I'm talking about, but also um, because uh, oral history, particularly in its history in the UK, um, has this kind of focus on, uh, obviously, individual agents acting in the world and making history. So oral history in the UK has a particular kind of radical history as a radical methodology, as um, a method used both by um, academics and activists and community historians as a way of putting those who are kind of marginalized um, from history and uh, using those kinds of stories to, might, to transform what we might think about as history. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, women's history, LGBT history, you know, labor history, um, in the UK is a kind of significant site uh, for the development of oral history. Um, so in that sense then, it really seems, I suppose, it's very much uh, bound up with notions of humanist agency and humans acting in and on the world. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, the question is, <laughs> is um, you know, can we do something with it in the context of a kind of post-human world? And so um, I'm going to um, draw on some research that I've carried out and which um, is this book that Yannick has just mentioned is coming out shortly, um, which is based on oral ethnographic research and oral history interviews with women environmental activ activists um, in this place called Clackwat Sand, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, in British Columbia in Canada. So it was really nice to see those uh, slides from Oliver uh, Kellerman earlier. That's uh, Cortez Island, which is the other side of Vancouver Island. But anyway, in the kind of same ballpark is where I'm talking about. So, you know, uh, some other kind of links between the papers in terms of locations. Um, and I suppose part of the points to raise about this project is that although the book is coming out uh, next month, um, the research on which this um, project was based was carried out uh, largely in the mid-1990s, um, early 90s to mid-90s. So partly I want to say that it, this was, uh, the research was carried out at a time before the turn to the post-humanities, I think, had really taken off in the way that it has. Um, so I think it's interesting that if I was going and doing that research now, the kinds of methodological questions that I might be thinking about going to do that research, I think would be very um, different. So yeah, so it was both a, a kind of time and a topic before, before this methodological um, turn, I suppose, and kind of conceptual turn. Um, and I want to turn to um, this quote from Sarah Watmore, which I find kind of fruitful in, um, in my process of kind of rethinking what the oral histories that I was doing were about. Um, um, and this is, Sarah Watmore's a cultural geographer or rural, started out as a rural geographer in the UK. Um, and she's, so she's talking about what's happening in cultural geography, but obviously it's not confined to cultural geography. And she, I liked the fact that she made this argument that what's happening around the more than human or the post-human or whatever kinds of terms we might use, that it's not about a rupture, um, but she's suggesting that it's the kind of product of repetition, the product of kind of repeating and returning to things. So... As somebody with a bit of a historical imagination, I liked this attention um, to historicity. And I liked as well how she wrote about her early work as a rural geographer. Um, and her, in her paper, her kind of gentle and careful reminder that, where she pointed out that her concern um, in the, with the obdurately earthy interests in cultivation and property, growing and eating, were not always seen in a fashionable light. So she's making this point that research that she carried out as a rural geographer in the kind of 70s, it was not very fashionable then to be interested in farming and soil and earthworms and growing things in the way that maybe these things are very popular now. But at the same time, I was um, then surprised when, at the, in the close of this paper, given this kind of attention to history, historicity, she talked about the urgent need to supplement humanist methods that rely on generating talk and text with experimental practices that might amplify other sensory, bodily, and affective registers um, in order to extend the company and modality of what might constitute a research subject. So this is kind of one of the departure points for me uh, in terms of this rethinking of oral history. Um, so I'm, and I'm obviously not intending to um, object to the notion of experimental practices. But what I want to take issue with really is the splitting of humanist methods, which are seen to generate talk and text, um, with experimental practices um, which are seen to amplify other registers. Um, and I suppose I'm also taking issue in a way with the, the temporality of her claim about urgency. Um, 
Um, partly kind of because I want to say and, you know, hopefully convince you through the end that humanist methods might also always be experimental. So just the brief, anybody who's ever done an interview will know that they're never the same. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you can prepare all you like, <laughs> but you never quite know what's going to happen when you knock on that door or turn on that tape recorder, what somebody is going to tell you or disclose in the context of kind of research projects. Um, and so my suggestion is not so much that we necessarily need experimental practices which amplify other registers in the process of research, but, also, but, but rather that the amplification is probably required <clears throat> at least as much in the interpretation and communication of research. And this is part of what I try and do in my discussion of, um, discussion of the research in um, Tlaquot Sound. Um, so that we can, so that the process of research and writing up and redescription and interpretation might take account of other registers that coexist and co-emerge with talk. Um, and so, conversely, um, to suggest as well that the kinds of experimental practices that what more might have in mind will almost inevitably also involve talk and text. Um, but there's also, but there's the tendency, I think, in the kind of the turn. Um, to new methods to downplay uh, the role of talk and text in experimental methods rather than realizing that, you know, um, very generally they're part, of, um, they're part of this. And I suppose that's a kind of version of multimodality that Leslie was talking about in a way. Um, but sometimes it seems to me that there's a kind of resounding silence about the talk and text <laughs> that's happening in the context of other projects. Um, so, you know, I want to come back at the end to the possibility of using supposedly humanist methods um, to kind of expand this notion of what might constitute um, a research subject. And, and I mean, the other point here is just that I think it's interesting that without even mentioning interviews, uh, you know, Susan, uh, Sarah Watmore manages, I think, to convey that that's really what she's talking about here is largely the kind of social science interview. Um, so what I want to do is I'm gonna do a really kind of quick, brief overview of some work on, on post-humanism just to situate where I'm coming from and on the one hand I'm hoping that some of this is familiar to people and then on the other hand because of course we have kind of diverse disciplines in the, in the audience maybe it isn't um, uh, familiar to everybody or also just to show kind of where I'm coming coming in at this and then I'll kind of move on to the to kind of discuss the empirical work. Um, so um, so I always like to turn to Haraway. <laughs> uh, it's always a kind of key uh, text for me. And so this is kind of one version of post-humanism. So I just want to unpack several versions, unpack briefly several versions of post-humanism. So Haraway is talking about this version of post-humanism that is a kind of transhumanist techno enhancement. Um, so this notion that of kind of prosthesis or, you know, just that the technology allows some kind of extension. Um, and uh, as you can tell from this, Haraway is not at all <laughs> I'm keen on this kind of version of um, post-humanism, um, that she thinks that this uh, can be too easily appropriated by the blissed out, let's all be post-humanist and find our next teleological evolutionary stage in some kind of transhumanist techno enhancement. Um, she's not impressed. So she... Um, so she turns to companion species. One of her arguments for turning to companion species is to get away from post-humanism, and she now you know, tries to avoid using the term as much as she can. Now, obviously, this is just one version of um, post-humanism. So, um, <clears throat> so this is Bray Dotty um, talking about two slightly different versions of post-humanism. Um, so she talks about a philosophical post-human of the post-structuralist generation. And she talks about a second version of post-humanism, which is a more targeted form of post-anthropocentrism that is not as widespread. Um, so yeah, so a very different account of post-humanism to Haraway's, even though obviously their work is kind of very engaged with each other. Um, and, um, and I suppose I find Braidotti's account quite interesting because I think that this uh, first form of post-humanism that she identifies as, as kind of post-structuralism is not what a lot of people would maybe take uh, as kind of post-humanism. And I think here what she's referring to, which is useful given my interest in kind of interviews and oral history and narrative, is this notion of um, 
of post-structuralism um, being kind of part of a move towards unpacking the notion of a kind of essentialist identity in kind of interview transcripts or whatever. So, so she's kind of suggesting here that we might think about um, that process of looking at interviews and accounts for a, a non-essentialized kind of identity or account of the self as a kind of site of post-humanism. Um, but obviously the second... Um, post-humanism that she's identifying here, which is, this, which is more explicitly a form of post-anthropocentrism, so a kind of move um, away from human centrism, <clears throat> I guess, that um, you know, might be identified with uh, humanism. Um, so this is useful to me, and I think um, her first account here chimes to me a little bit with um, Catherine Hales, who we've also already heard mention of. So this notion that posthumanism is not about the addition of some prosthesis, but it's the ability to be subjective in the view of the self. So, um, so I find this quite useful for thinking about interviews. But I'm still interested in this, in Braidotti's kind of post-anthropocentric um, posthumanism and how we might think about moving um, kind of beyond human centrism or decentering the human. Um, and so I'm also just briefly going to mention the work by... Richard Twine, where he's picking this up, and his, uh, he's done a lot of work on ecofeminism, so which is partly why I'm kind of naming, although in this paper um, he doesn't explicitly name his approach as ecofeminist, he's citing Val Plumwood and various other ecofeminists and talking about feminism and environmentalism. Um, and Twine, as well, is kind of trying to distinguish between posthumanisms. Well, but, but trying to kind of define a kind of critical posthumanism, which is again not this kind of techno enhancement, um, but a critical posthumanism that's inflected by feminism and environmentalism, and which he's suggesting that um, is not necessarily radically opposed to all variations of humanism. And I think here he's picking up on some of Al Plumwood's work that there might be human benefits to decentering the human in a way. Um, so that's a kind of familiar feminist. Argument And here as well, I just want to return briefly to Haraway and her um, account of why she never wanted to be post-human. I never wanted to be post-human or post-humanist any more than I wanted to be post-feminist. So making this argument that obviously women have often been excluded from the category of human. And so a kind of argument here that women have never been human um, and that's why she will never be a post-humanist or a post feminist. Um, so, and this brings me to um, this point by Dimitri Papadopoulos, um, that one kind of tendency sometimes in some work on post-humanism is that um, how is it possible to homogenize non-humans? Um, I've just made a mistake there, so that should be how, it is, how is it possible to homogenize humans? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, when I was typing this out, I had slightly more non-humans on the brain. So he's, he's saying that, um, <laughs> that something that happens in the turn to post-humanism is that the human um, becomes homogenized again. Um, and I think this, uh, this point about the sometimes the, kind of the social drops out of this account of the human, and the human is kind of re-reified, which I guess is what I'm saying we can see in Haraway's kind of critique and her um, reluctance to engage with post-humanism. So, holding that in mind, because um, I will come back to these in my analysis, I want to turn to um, Clackwood Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, where in the early um, 1990s, um, there was a campaign against deforestation, against clear-cut logging of temperate rainforest on the west coast of Canada. Um, and a peace camp was set up uh, here in this kind of middle photo um, to protest the logging. Um, the peace camp was, and so, so people camped over three or four months. For those of you familiar, say, with something like Greenham Common in the UK, this was 10 years after the Greenham Common uh, peace camp um, was set up. So people came to the, to the, to the camp, um, camped out overnight, and then got up really early the following morning, kind of 3 or 4 a.m., to go onto logging roads um, and block the logging roads before the loggers came in at daylight. So that's what we're seeing here. And then um, the, the police, the, the RCMP, came along and arrested uh, people and, who stood on the road and brought them to, um, 
to jail where people were processed. So over the course of the summer, uh, there were blockades every, mor every morning, Monday to Friday, and um, over 800 people were arrested, and many people saved, served jail sentences as part of this kind of non-violent um, protest. Um, and I went um, in 1996 and interviewed a lot of the women involved in this campaign. So the campaign was said to be based on feminist and eco-feminist principles. It was a mixed camp, so there were men and women at the camp, but there was this sense of it being informed um, by feminism. And I was very interested at this point in the early to mid-90s about uh, feminist debates about essentialism and the ways in which ecofeminism was being dismissed for being essentialist, um, and particularly strongly by other feminists. Um, and I was interested in my sense that there was, there, there was something more going on in ecofeminism than some kind of repetition of essentialism or repetition of maternalism. So, um, so the basis of my research was going and um, interviewing women who'd been involved um, about their involvement in the camp and also um, doing kind of life history interviews, so kind of oral history of camp life and also of their life histories. Um, so one of the points that I want to make here that, that at the time puzzled me um, hugely when I was asking people to be involved in the research, but um, makes a little bit more sense <laughs> um, in retrospect was when I was asking people and saying that I wanted to hear about their experiences of the camp and the campaign and that I wanted to situate this in the context of their lives so that I was also interested in a kind of biographical interview, uh, life history interview. So most people were very happy to be involved and to be interviewed, but there were a number of people who made a distinction between being interviewed about the camp and the campaign and having a kind of life history interview of themselves. And I was initially puzzled about why people were kind of saying they didn't want to do the life history bit, but they were happy to talk about the camp, and I probably initially just thought they were shy. <laughs> but um, in retrospect, I mean, I make sense of this in terms of people wanting to avoid heroic narratives. So a kind of commitment to um, the campaign and to the politics as a collective process and uh, um, a resistance to any individuals being picked out, which was you know, not quite my intention, but I wasn't thinking about it like that. So we're very happy to talk endlessly <laughs> about the camp and the campaign, but not to center themselves in any way. Um, so this was yeah, quite interesting for me to, to, um, to, to figure out in terms of thinking about humanist <laughs> projects. Um, and so what I want to do is to focus on um, an interview with one woman and take some quotes um, from one woman to think about what might have been going on um, in her interview and how we might think about a move from uh, a kind of humanist notion of agency to maybe some kind of more than human self. Um, so this is uh, a woman called J <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Jane Fawkes, who um, was about 60 when I interviewed her. Uh. And um, she's an artist, um, and she's married, <clears throat> and had some grown sons. And um, this was one account of, you know, one extract from her interview, um, saying, so anyway, we just got to the camp that evening. That I was really, she was really concerned about her granddaughter, and she just thought, you know, I have to go and get, um, this is why I'm, you know, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for my granddaughter. Um, and so... So I want to suggest that there's kind of something about humanist agency in here, this notion that she can do this thing, that she can take this action, that it might have some, um, it might have some impact on the world. Um, and in a way, it's a kind of paradigmatic story of ecofeminist activism as well, this notion of kind of also concern about a child. Um, but I also want to suggest there's some other things going on in uh, other parts of Jane's account. So... I want to suggest that we can see something of, you know, what I called earlier this kind of post-structuralist subjectivity going on. So late, this is late in the interview with Jane, and I realised I hadn't asked her any questions explicitly about feminism, so I asked, you know, would you describe yourself as a feminist? And she um, immediately responds by talking about motherhood um, and how she liked being a mother, and that at this point... Um, when I suppose she was a mother of young children, was in the mid-60s, and so she's recognising that this was a time of a kind of emergence of feminism and that, you know, she's making this point that actually at the time uh, she thought that her friends who became involved in feminism um, 
you know, that it wasn't a really good move for them because she was really happy <laughs> and they became um, kind of very, very miserable. Um, but, um, but it seems to me that there's some of this kind of reflection on sub subjectivity going on and this kind of continues when she goes on to say that eventually, you know, she has come to identify as a feminist. Um, you know, that she really sort of gossiped and now she's trying to teach, you know, she's spending, expending kind of considerable energy within her own family, uh, talking to her husband and sons and trying to help them to kind of get feminism and why, uh, why she's a feminist and um, the kind of labour involved in all of this. Um, so, so I think there's a little bit of a shift here to a sense of her account of kind of transformation and change. Um, but I think this is still a fairly kind of humanist uh, story. So um, the next quote that I want to put up um, is actually from the very beginning of the interview. So these, these uh, quotes I've been showing haven't obviously been in the order of the interview. So I want to um, put up this quote about uh, where she actually started the interview. And this was um, after me um, explaining at great length about why I was interested in people's kind of biographies and lives and histories and that, you know, she could tell it whatever way she wanted and start wherever she wanted. And, um, and Jane actually seemed quite impatient while I was doing my kind of spiel <laughs> at the beginning. Um, so this is where she started. Um, so she started her account in the middle of her life, like not at the kind of chronological beginning. So she started about the year before she went to Tlaqua and was arrested. Um, and, um, um, and so partly what she's saying in here is that at that point, about a year before the Tlaqua camp, she was really um, reflecting on her own early experience of sexual abuse um, and that this was what was going on. Um, and actually, when she's telling me that, she's saying that she was in no place or no position to get arrested at the camp, in fact. So she was just like, oh, I just had too much going on. Um, but actually, her husband was really interested in getting um, arrested uh, at the camp and that they uh, talked long and hard about it and eventually decided that he would um, get arrested and that she would kind of support him in the process. Um, but actually, in the end, she changes her mind and she goes and gets arrested um, as well. Um, but, I mean, in providing kind of different um, accounts of why Jane um, says that she gets arrested and why she ends at the camp, I'm obviously not trying to suggest that uh, Jane is kind of confused or inconsistent. Um, but rather that there's obviously many stories about why she does what she does and many ways in which she makes um, sense of it. Um, but also, I um, want to suggest here that this, that what I was then beginning to see once I uh, spent a long time pouring over her interview, is that this, for me, was not a humanist narrative of agency, right? It's, for me, it wasn't actually about a teleology from child to adult, adult, from passivity or even victimhood to agency or heroism when she got arrested. Um, but it is this move of turning and returning to her life, right, in the course of the interview. She's kind of turning and returning to moments in her life and um, restoring them in various ways and, and, um, and thinking about how um, meanings have kind of changed over time. Um, and, and partly what I'm trying to do is to kind of do some justice in a way by actually putting her account out of uh, order in which she told us to kind of convey some of the ways in which she did to tell the story. Um, and, um, and so partly as well, I wanted to do, um, partly I wanted to play with some text, and this is um, just um, kind of very simple ideas um, about how we might play it with text or think about uh, what Jane might have been doing in her interview and what kind of account she's um, producing. So partly I'm using a notion from um, Dmitry Papadopoulos that I mentioned earlier of kind of continuous experience. So this notion that experience might be continuous rather than just kind of cumulative and, and kind of linear um, and narrative. But I also want to make a point, obviously, about uh, academic conventions of presenting kind of quotes in the neat way that I have been up until um, now. <laughs> um, and we don't present the kind of mess around the, the edges. So I just wanted to kind of mess with the quotes a little bit um, and make them a little bit incomprehensible in the way that sometimes listening to somebody's story for the first time is a little bit incomprehensible because there's a lot of stuff coming. Um, 
But I also wanted to make the point that even though um, the conventions are to present the quotes nice and neatly, I mean, we all know, or once you've been an academic <laughs> um, for a little while or a student for a little while, you know that those quotes are not as neat as they look. So there's the convention of presenting the neat quotes extracted from something. But actually, we all know the massive amount of labor that goes into producing those quotes. And we also know, <clears throat> I think, about the, what I might call the excess of the interview and the excess of what's going on that doesn't always make it into either the conference presentation or the written paper. Um, and although it doesn't always make it into the paper or into the paper directly, maybe makes it into the written up publications indirectly, I also want to say that at the same time it would be disingenuous um, to pretend that we don't know that the practice is messy, you know, that it's, it's not as kind of simple as just critiquing people for not presenting everything or for extracting kind of particular quotes. Um, so I want to talk about while, while I was interviewing Jane, that I interviewed her in the kitchen of her house where she has moved after her experience of getting arrested at Tlaquot. So although she and her husband had moved to kind of retire um, out of Vancouver City to Comox Valley on Vancouver Island, after the um, experience of getting arrested and being involved in the campaign, they moved again to Denman Island, which is not so far from Cortes Island earlier, um, to, be, to live among people that they had met in the campaign. So they upped sticks again, basically. Um, and they bought a piece of land that they're living on with five other families in five different households um, and they're engaging in permaculture on the land and they're trying to grow trees and small forest with a view to selective logging in the future so not the kind of clear-cut logging but trying to think differently about um, different ways in which you might kind of engage with forestry so there's this whole um, kind of story that I'm being told kind of before during and after the interview which you know informs um, you know, my kind of understanding of Jane. And there's, so one more quote from the interview. So at some point when she is talking about being a child, and this is the point when she was being abused, um, she makes this point, and for me, because she had a lonely childhood, because she wasn't able to relate to people. So for me, sort of nature and being alone with nature was really important. Um, J Jane was not the only person that I interviewed who produced this a kind of account of a childhood where there was a separation between um, the public world and the kind of social world, the private world of the kind of domestic world, and, um, and a world of nature, <laughs> which was kind of outside the social, in a way, or something. It, or it was, the, I mean, obviously it's not outside the social, particularly because a lot of girls could no longer access the space after they're 12. So I'm not saying it's outside the social, but it was this other space. So I think it kind of complicates the dualisms that were often... Uh, that we often think about, um, especially if we think about how children might relate to dualisms um, and how people might kind of find spaces and places where they can manage. But the point here is, so she's talking about this lonely experience and that nature was the only place um, that she could go. And actually what I'm trying to say is that through the interview and through her, um, through her story of the campaign and what happened through the campaign and of how she's transformed her sense of self so that she is no longer uh, a kind of lonely child in nature, but rather is part of um, this collective experience of the peace camp for starters. So she, she talks at length about how she, there's no way she could have gotten arrested on her own because of her kind of fear of authority, but the fact that there were hun literally hundreds of people at the camp every day in a kind of huge production, so that that's really important. But also that her experience of nature is now transformed from this nature that is external. So that kind of childhood story still looks like a, you know, she's in nature, but it's separate from her, it's apart from her. But this experience of living on community, on with the land, <laughs> um, and this experience of kind of permaculture and trying to think of being in a different relationship with trees, anyway, is part of me trying to suggest that maybe we can approach interviews and oral histories and apparently kind of humanist methods and kind of retrieve um, um, a little bit of them so that we can also go back to this quote that I showed to start off with and think differently about this. Um, so this is the one about turning up with a camp and a grandmother. Um, and I'm just going to put Butler in here as well, I suppose, as she's one of those people who's held up as one of those post-structuralist subjectivity people, but this notion of being undone. And I want to suggest that in this previous quote that we could think about this as Jane being undone by her granddaughter 
but also being undone by the devastation um, of the kind of the landscape around her that so that she is being undone and kind of redone through the process of the campaign and through the process of the kind of changes that she's constantly making in her in her life um, and um, and so you know what more also says this but I think I'm trying to say that we don't uh, yeah, again, it's not a point about kind of a critique of experimental practices. It's like, what can we still, you know, <laughs> what can we still get out of the interview or oral history in this time so that, um, that there might be this shift from the indifferent stuff of a world out there um, to the intimate fabric of corporal reality that includes and redistributes the in here of the human being. And I think there's something of this going on in Jane's account, basically, um, that, you know, it's not this progress narrative, it's not a kind of neoliberal individualist story of victimhood and heroism. Um, and so, just to finish, so we might think about this as not so much humanist methods, but about Haraway's version of kind of becoming worldly when we have never been human. Um, anyway, so that's where I'm going to finish. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, last but not least, we have Iris Malafai. Uh, Iris is an Associate Professor of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Recent publications are Generational Feminism, New Materialist Introduction to a Generative Approach by Lexington Books in 2015, and the subject of Rosie Bridotti, Politics and Concepts, edited with B. Blaghart, uh, Bloomsbury Academic 2014, and of course, New Materialisms, Interviews and Cartographies with Rick Dolfijn, Open Humanities Press 2012. Yes. Okay, thank you, Janneke, for uh, introducing me, and also thank you to the three speakers. Um, I am, um, we're, well, everybody's already said this, we're all from dif different disciplines, so some things, also in my presentation, some things will be familiar and other things won't. Um, but luckily, I will speak most of all as a philosopher, um, as a philosopher of science or a philosopher of the humanities. Um, but I will move in and out of examples constantly, so I will just read my paper from the beginning to the end, trusting there is something in it for each of us. Um, after all, it is all about, I think this whole, this entire seminar is all about a way of presenting ways of thinking, way, presenting methodologies, or rather, how can we enter into certain methodologies? Um, because we all, uh, as uh, also Niam just made perfectly clear, we are all very much saturated with like these humanist assumptions that we are now trying to move away from. So my contribution, this, what is, how does this work? Yeah. My contribution discusses diffractive reading um, and asks questions about the spatial temporality about the, uh, of, of this methodology. Um, I will be asking the question, where and when does diffraction happen in reading processes? So furthering Donna Haraway's 1992 and 1997 formulations on the need to intimately diffract instead of reflect from a distance, Karen Barad began explicitly practicing the reading through one another of texts and or oeuvres in her 2003 article, post-humanist performativity toward an understanding of how matter comes to matter. Furthermore, Barat has always been very clear about the importance of the distinction between classical and quantum ways of conceptualizing diffraction as a phenomenon out there in, for example, her seminal monograph, Meeting the Universe Halfway. The classical take on diffraction imports the logics of both entities and linear causality. It distinguishes particles and waves and sees waves as resulting from obstruction. Quantum understandings affirm that particles can produce wave patterns and refrain from, uh, the, so quantum understandings refrain from entity logic and linearity while affirming both logics as possible actualizations of a ontologically complex space-time mattering, as she says. So diffractive reading, I think, is part of the post-humanities because of the fact that it traverses the famous two cultures by embarking on a theoretical physics journey in humanities departments and by invi inviting physicists and all other scholars, in fact, 
um, to consider the research process along the lines of situated knowledges. Situated knowledges have always been transversal, as Donna Haraway, who coined the term, of course, did not affirm the boys from either the natural sciences or the human sciences, but rather did she run with, and this is a quote from her, some of us who tried to stay sane in these dissembled and dissembling times by holding out for a feminist version of objectivity. The latter scholars do not have a sex or gender or a discipline that could count as a full-fledged starting point. They had a demand, a desire, a yearning for something, feminist objectivity. In addition, while reworking humanities categories, such as the social constructs of sex and gender or of the academic disciplines, also the human, that is the alleged container of the mind and the point of origin of thinking, writing, reading, is reworked. Diffractive reading does not shy away from an en engagement with our originary humanicity, which engagement simply wants to affirm everything that went into a or the human. I think this is very much what this seminar has been about, or is about. Interestingly, Felicity Coleman's recent work demonstrates that every one of the above-mentioned departures from the humanities as, so as social constructivist, and remember that biological determinism is an approach of, social, of a social constructivism too, so um, every one of the above-mentioned departures from the humanities as social constructivist may feed into a theory of feminicity, as she calls it. Just like Haraway affirmed that it is a feminist objectivity we are looking for. Like poems, which are sites of literary production where language too is an actor independent of intentions and authors, bodies as objects of knowledge are material semiotic generative nodes. Their boundaries materialize in social interaction. Boundaries are drawn by mapping practices. Objects do not pre-exist as such. Objects are boundary projects. But boundaries shift from within. Boundaries are very tricky. What boundaries provisionally contain remains generative, productive of meanings and bodies. Citing, citing boundaries is a risky practice. Vicky Kirby argues indeed that the human, or anthropomorphism, is a boundary project. Importantly, um, to allow anthropomorphism, its non-local ubiquity, is not to refuse its specificity, but rather to acknowledge that anthropomorphisms, infinite differentiations, specificities, are expressions of one phenomenon, one implicated space-time mattering. How we approach this phenomenon, which includes us, a phenomenon whose identifications entail constant morphogenesis, is to open the question of the human and writing, as if for the first time. Oops, sorry. Um, in her book, Quantum Anthrop her book, Quantum Anthropology, so Vicky Kirby's book, Quantum Anthropology, does precisely this. She opens the question. And here in my paper today, I will discuss its methodological implications for the reading post-humanity scholar. What do we do when we sit behind our desks, epistemologically, ontologically, ethically speaking? Janneke Adema here present, seconds Kirby um, when she explains that the book we are reading or writing is an apparatus by cons uh, consisting of an entanglement of relationships between, among others, authors, books, the outside world, readers, the material production and political economy of book publishing and the discursive formation of scholarship, end of quote. And Felicity Coleman explains why Vicky Kirby's work or diffractive reading per se, is a feminist strategy. The gist is asking questions about boundary work, and while all resulting binaries are gendered or sexed, it doesn't really matter what we say, um, Kirby and diffraction uncover a much more complex starting point, an active point in Coleman's words. Wherever and whenever a feminist strategy has identified, intervened, and offered an analysis of the singularity of the politically gendered body, situating it within its relational, multiplanar, materially constituted world is an example of what I refer to as a feminist active point and is evidence of a change enabler that I call an action of feminicity. So this was, of course, Coleman. 
The introduction I just gave implies some basic distinctions and that while they seem quite firmly in place in academic work coming from either of the two cultures, the world of scholarship is much more complex. It's relational, multiplanar, materially constituted, says Coleman. So let me offer two unreal distinctions that we try to work with. One, a diffractive reading is not a comparative reading as the idea of a comparison makes use of, full, of a false atomistic logic, text A and text B that we then compare. These epistemological assumptions will have ontological ramifications, albeit that even classificatory approaches show cracks. They never work. Comparative studies assume a bounded human who has made up his or her mind about two different texts and their origin. Two, um, wait a second, is this correct? Yes. Diffractive reading does not make a difference between time and space as most theorizations of temporality spatialize time. This, again, is an epistemological decision with ontological ramifications. Diffractive reading affirms a jumping of scale or of generation occurring behind one's desk. Diffractions happen. While distant reading projects are undertaken and the apps or tools of the digital humanities are or are not calibrated for the recording of algorithmic micromovements, diffractions happen. While close comparative readings are made, um, human scholars, who are always already cyborgs, which we heard from Leslie, find themselves in the situation of or of not embarking on journeys suggested by the cracks, the diffractions. Embarking on them is what I've been doing in my work of diffracting Simondon and Cassira, for instance, and this is work I co conducted together with my colleague Odd Sissel Hull in 2013. Finally, diffractions are indeed sudden rememberings. Oops. Yeah, this is correct. Finally, diffractions are indeed sudden rememberings, pointing to quantum states, including quantum leaps, jumps, superposition, and entanglement, as Barad loosely states in the acknowledgement section of her 2010 paper, Quantum Entanglements and the Hauntological Relations of Inheritance. In this paper, I will argue that just like the quantum physics of the two-slit experiment is hauntological and involves nature-culture transversality, situatedness, and feminism, the diffractive readings of the post-humanities even involve the remembrance of unread texts. Also, I will claim that the humanities have always been perfectly capable of acknowledging precisely this quantum entanglement, although they have not theorized it. The post of the post-humanities is hardly linear. This under-theorization or sheer ignorance of quantum entanglement is not at all proof of the defeat of humanists. So let us listen to the first five minutes of the recently broadcasted Entanglement episode of Lulu Miller's and Alex Spiegel's Invisibilia podcast from National Public Radio. From NPR News, this is Invisibilia. I'm Elise Spiegel. And I'm Lulu Miller. One day last summer, because we wanted to see something truly magical, Lulu and I found ourselves standing in front of a huge table covered in lasers and mirrors while a very nervous physicist hovered nearby. I try not to bump anything here. <laughs> the nervous physicist, and our guide for the day, was a grad student from the University of Maryland named David Huckel. It doesn't look like these things do anything, but I promise you all of the pieces on this table are important. <laughs> and David had brought us to the table because he wanted to use the many lasers and mirrors to try to perform something called quantum entanglement. Yeah. He was going to try to take two separate atoms and using his laser, turn them into the same thing. At the simplest level of entanglement, it's just the idea that two things that are separated in space can still be the same thing. That's Jeff Brumfield, a physics guy at NPR. 
who we brought along to help us try to make sense of what we were about to see. You can have an object that exists in two different spaces and still the same object. I mean, that's wild. That's totally weird, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so if you look at that screen right there. So David directed our attention to the first atom, which sat in a metal box on one side of the table. You could actually see it on a screen right above the box. It looked like a little pulsing green dot. So you're looking at it right now. And then he pointed us to the other atom, four feet away across the table in an identical metal box. We typically refer to the, the atoms as east and west because, well, the cardinal directions. <laughs> two separate physical things in two different places. They pulsed and spun at their own rate. They were completely different individuals, so to speak. But then, David pressed a button. One, two, three, go. And lasers shoot out of this contraption on the table. And those lasers hit the atoms and make them spin faster until they each emit a photon, which David and his team can make crash into each other in a way that then connects and entangles the atoms that those photons have left behind them. Now, to know whether it has actually worked, David has rigged up a device that makes an audible click any time entanglement is actually successful. So we wait. And then... So there's entanglement going on right now between these two chambers. <laughs> Those two atoms, east and west, are now one even though they still sit four feet across from each other on a table. And it's amazing, you can wave your hand in the middle of it and it doesn't affect it. Wow. If David and his colleagues did something to change one of the atoms in its little box, they could be 100% certain that the other atom still in its little box would also change. It's almost like destiny. Now the US government is actually funding this work in the hopes of making a computer network, a quantum computer network that could ensure with absolute certainty that information that traveled between two parties was not breached. And so far, scientists have been able to get entanglement to occur at a distance of just over 88 miles. Though theoretically, you could fly one atom to the moon, and still, if you affected it in some way, the other atom back on Earth would be affected instantaneously in the same way. I mean, that's wild. That's totally bizarre. The guys who do these, this research don't understand it. They tell me they don't understand it. It's just there. It's, you know, it's math and it works. And you don't even need lasers to get it to work. Quantum entanglement, the scientists told us, probably happens all the time in the natural world. Like there could be one particle of you right now entangled with a person that you just passed on the street. The idea that two objects that are physically separated, I mean really physically separated over miles or, you know, eons or whatever, time, space, what have you, are still the same thing is something so foreign. I think it just makes me cautious, I guess, about what I think is possible. What, what, the, what I think I understand about the way the world works, because there's this very common thing at a very small level that doesn't correspond to anything we understand about the universe. Okay, so summing up and leaving distant reading out of the equation for this presentation, comparison must be seen as either a quantum leaping so a transition from one quantum state to another, but there is no original or copy, or maybe, as in Stephen Greenblatt's multidisciplinary comparisons of the new historicism, a superposition, which involves one particle being in, one, in two quantum states at the same time. Diffractive reading, however, brings the discussion to yet another register, the third register. Is this still working? Yeah. Quantum entanglements, says Karen Barat, are generalized quantum superpositions, more than one, no more than one, impossible to count. 
they are far more ghostly than the colloquial sense of entanglement suggests. Quantum entanglements are not the intertwining of two or more states, entities, events, but a calling into question of the very nature of two-ness and ultimately of oneness as well. Duality, unity, multiplicity, being are undone. Between will never be the same. One is too few, two is too many. No wonder quantum entanglements defy common sense notions of communication between entities separated by arbitrarily <coughs> large spaces and times. Quantum entanglements require or inspire a new sense of accountability, a new arithmetic, a new calculus of responsibility. Entanglements of there, of here, there, now, then. Entanglements between one side of the Danube and the other, between La Palma and Tenerife in the Canary Islands, between Elsinore and Copenhagen, between Newton's time and the 21st century, between life and death. So what does this profess? That diffraction invol involves a radical methodology for the post-humanities. And I don't mean this in this woo kind of way, because I will present, hopefully, a convincing case later on in, in a minute. So Barat argues the following. Meeting the universe halfway, meditation on quantum physics, entanglements of matter and meaning, diffraction as a scenic dock of entangled phenomenon, intraactive metaphysics, difference. Diffraction as methodology, reading texts intraactively through one another, enacting new patterns of engagement, and attending to how exclusions matter. So if Barat sees diffraction as a figure of, t of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa. Diffraction stands for an entangled phenomenon, quantum entanglement, interactive metaphysics, and difference. Previously, indeed, I argued diffraction in the entails nature culture transversality, situatedness, and feminism. So now I will try to make all of this concrete with an example, the work I have done on Suzanne K. Langer. How is her work in and of itself diffractive as in a quantum entanglement? So Suzanne Langer, um, she lived between 1895 and 1985. She dedicated two of her books to scholars making a rather weird combination. Philosophy in a New Key, a study in the symbolism of reason, read and, uh, write and art, is dedicated to Alfred North Whitehead. Between 1924 and 1926, Langer wrote her PhD dis dissertation with Whitehead as her advisor at Radcliffe College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, then the women's college running parallel to Harvard University. Langer calls Whitehead, my great teacher and friend, on the opening page of her stellar bestseller. Philosophy in the New Key is a really best, was a really bestseller. The book's sequel, Feeling and Form, a theory of art developed from philosophy in a new key, was published in 1953 with the dedication to the happy memory of Ernst Cassirer. Langer, um, she was born in New, in New York City to German immigrants, had started reading Cassirer in the 1920s, but only met him in 1941 after the latter had also migrated to the United States. They stayed closely in touch until Cassirer's death in 1945, a year before Langer's translation of his um, Sprache und Mythos from 1925 came out. When I first heard about Langer through a student, I could not believe a scholar had existed who had worked across such wide variety of philosophers, Whitehead on the one hand and Cassirer on the other hand. Several cartographies exist of scholars influential to Langer's work. In the preface to the third edition of Philosophy in the New Key, Langer argues that her book, although imperfect and representing the embryonic stages of her thought, still proclaims the work of a brilliant, though strangely assorted, intellectual generation. Whitehead, Russell, Wittgenstein, Freud, Cassirer, to name but a few who launched the attack on the formidable problem of symbol and meaning and established the keynote of philosophical thought in our day. Feeling and Form, in turn, the book, uh, which is a, a book I think for this audience quite important because it wants to answer the question, what does art create? It's a very ontological book. This book um, closes cartographically. Here she says, 
Despite all shortcomings, blind leads, or mistakes that they may see in each other's doctrines, I believe that Bell, Fry, Bergson, Grotje, Bansch, Collingwood, Kassirer, and I, um, not to forget such literary critics as Barfield and Day Lewis and others too, whom I have not named and perhaps not even read, have been and are really engaged on one philosophical project. It was Kassirer, though he never regarded himself an aesthetician, who hooed the keystone of the structure in his broad and disinterested study of symbolic forms. And I, for my part, would put that stone in place to join and sustain what so far we have built. How remarkable that Langer finds herself in the sole company of man. There is somebody who has written a literary bi biography of Langer, um, and he opened this biography with the words that she was one of the first women to pursue an academic career in philosophy in the United States and the first to receive both professional and popular recognition as an American philosopher. Um, however, as the research of Arabella Lyon shows, scholarship often subsumes Langer under the heading of the male scholars that she herself lists, whereas her own ideas qualitatively shift the work of her teachers and colleagues. Lyon also mentions Langer's own denial of any impact of the fact that she was a woman, contrary to proofs such as Langer's lowly ranked post PhD position at Harvard, the fact that tenure came only at the very end of her career, and the necessity of Whitehead putting in a good word for Langer so that she could get her early work pu published in the journal Mind. Apart from gender, and this is my, my, part, my, my real point, also remarkable is Langer's phrasing, the brilliant, though strangely assorted, intellectual generation of the first cartography is really engaged on one philosophical project, according to the second. The appearance of the French philosopher Henri Bergson at the heart of an affirmation of a philosophical project, which is really one, comes as a surprise by the time the reader of Feeling and Form has reached the monograph's conclusion. Um, the table of contents even announces a lengthy discussion of Bergson's work as Bergson's failing. Whereas Langer typifies Bergson as the artist's favorite philosopher whose dream of duration brings his metaphysics to the very brink of a philosophy of art, he is also said to suffer from a lock, lack of logical daring. So she says he is not logical, by the way, um, basically. Although Whitehead has disappeared from the second cartography, but not at all from feeling and form as a whole, the praise for both him and Kassirer stands in sharp contrast to Langer's treatment of Bergson, the illogical philosopher, the, the philosopher that artists love. She seems to have one clear negative opinion about Bergson, although she opens feeling and form with a statement about polemics and their distortive role in philosophizing that I deem Bergsonian. Langer writes, were I to follow out every refutation of other doctr doctrines which my line of argument implies, that line would be lost in a tangle of controversy. Consequently, I have avoided polemics as much as possible, though, of course, not altogether. This affirmative stance goes against the grain of scholarly habit, which inclination makes that the scholar is in real danger of losing one's way in the pigeon pigeonholes of purely academic description. So this is Bergson's take on polemics. Divergences are striking between the schools, that is to say, in short, between the groups of disciples formed around certain of the great masters. But would one find them as clear cut between the masters themselves? Something here dominates the diversity of systems, something, I repeat, simple and definite, like a sounding of which one feels that it has more or less reached the bottom of the same ocean, even though it brings each time to the surface very different materials. It is on these materials that disciples normally work in that is the role of analysis. And the master, in so far as he formulates, develops, translates into abstract ideas what he brings, is already, as it were, his own disciple. But the simple act, 
which has set analysis in motion and which hides behind analysis, emanates from a faculty quite different from that of analyzing. This is, by very definition, intuition. So apart from the fact that this quote is also analogous to Langer's take on scholars' obsession with class classifying artistic styles or traditions and on their consequence consequential failure to notice the problem of artistic creation per se, because that is what she wants to, to reach, one may ask how Bergson's take on polemics, or let's say on the entanglement of epistemology and ontology, forms the core of my interpretation of an approach to Langer's philosophy of art. The fact that this is contrary to Langer's own words, I have circumvented in a in a threefold manner in research that I have done on Langer. First, on a descriptive level, I have verified that even Langer herself ultimately reworks the assertion Bergson's failing. Second, it is sound to draw Bergson back, back in, in spite of claims to the contrary, because it is in the nature of the cartographical method to affirm that one's own relations to and the objective relations between philosophers are fundamentally open. Langer endorses this openness by even inclu including the work of, and that's, here it is in red, those whom I have not named and perhaps not even read to her bibliography. Elsewhere, she refers to, um, wait a second. Elsewhere, she refers to the literature behind us, known or unknown to any particular thinker. In Philosophy in a New Key, Langer says, quotations could be multiplied almost indefinitely. This is strange indeed. But this strangeness, oh, this is the literature behind us, known or unknown to any particular thinker. I mean, this is even what she includes to her own thought. So it's strange indeed, just like the, uh, the physicist said during it in the podcast. But strangeness is in the nature of quantum entanglement. And this type of diffraction characterizes, in my reading, Langer's philosophy and is part of the post-humanities. That's my talk. Uh, we've gone slightly over time, as usual, I'm afraid. So if anybody wants to or needs to leave, go ahead. It's all fine. But I would like to have at least maybe 10 to 15 more minutes of questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, is this on? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, just going to the, the presentation on ecofeminism. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Um, uh, I found it very interesting. Um, it's more a query about your um, your choice to not include, I guess, um, your choice to use oral history and Vancouver Island um, and not... Um, I guess what, what I was kind of almost wondering whether it comes through is the First Nations and the history on the land and I'm a geographer and it, the, the, again the choice of methodology and the place and the Coast Salish kind of history on the island but not input into your kind of work. I was just interested whether... Is this on? Um, okay, so that's obviously a huge question. So it is in the book and the broader project, which is the very short answer, because I'm not quite sure um, <laughs> how to uh, answer that briefly now, I suppose. So obviously it's a really important question, the, the land that, um, uh, that the, the, that's being deforested is obviously First Nations land in Canada. It's land that's never been ceded to the Canadian uh, government, um, you know, there are no uh, deeds or treaties, for instance. Um, um, uh, the camp was mainly white activists. Um, there were intense and complicated relationships with First Nations people. Yeah, I'm kind of struggling to give a, a short answer to that, because <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of partly frames the whole book. Um, 
we can just... talk after if you go into the pub. <laughs> yes, yeah, that might be easier rather than <laughs> trying to uh, rehearse a, a huge argument. But you know, it's an important question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alan, uh, just a question about your techniques now. And it was interesting you, you chose to use oral rather than video, um, and it is interesting because oral is so much less invasive than video. But also, paradoxically, it's much easier to edit what's said and, and in the way it's said as well. What was your prime reason for, for using sound and rather than video, I suppose? Um, I, think it's, I think it's safe to say that at the time it never occurred to me to use video, I don't think. <laughs> um, and I don't, you know... Um, I don't know now if that's something to do with, you know, changes in technology for starters, uh, so that now it would be a lot easier to go and video people, and at the time it wasn't, it wasn't so simple. Um, but, th you know, there are lots of things that I didn't do, and I suppose partly it's coming out of a tradition of feminist research, and I'm also talking about the early 90s and the choices that might be kind of made at that point, kind of conventionally, and kind of doing that was PhD research in the early 90s. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a good answer to that. I think I s still would have done oral history at the time. I mean... Um, I mean, partly what I'm saying is that I still think oral history is a really useful um, kind of methodology and approach. And, yeah, logistically, video would have been very difficult in terms of trying to wander around Vancouver Island uh, interviewing people. But, yeah. I, um, this is less invasive, though. It's one of the key things. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's why I wouldn't have done video. And also, video is very difficult with oral history because you have a talking head for, you know, three hours. Some of these interviews went on for an incredibly long time. So, I mean, there is a question about what would... Be, what would have been gained in terms of my uh, the analysis that I was doing by by doing kind of video interviews um, because I suppose I had this particular interest in in essentialism and how that kind of manifested in accounts of ecofeminism and in accounts of why women became involved in ecofeminist act activism so I suppose I was interested in people's accounts or stories which obviously could have been visual but yeah. Hi. Um, thanks very much. I'll keep the thanks brief because I know we're, uh, we're moving on. Uh, I want to just try, uh, this is going to be very embarrassing, I'm going to try a little bit of a diffractive reading of the panel and try and bring Leslie in as well. Um, I suppose because I'm thinking, I'm struck by how much we're coming back to text and writing. Uh, and so Leslie's talking about literacy. Um, and I'm just thinking... Uh, cause We've been using Haraway and Haraway's notion of media specificity, and then, well, we can see that because we seem to be moving away from uh, uh, writing, uh, that kind of the book, and then we're using um, Hales in saying about the post-human, uh, that's to do with the change in subjectivity. And so I'm kind of wondering whether we're talking a lot, how much we're talking about post-humanism and how much we're talking about post-humanities because a lot of the thinkers we've been referring to Barrett and Hales and Brydotti I can see how they're post-human and interested in the post-human I'm not so sure how much they're post-humanities um, I think they help us to think about post-humanities I'm not sure how much they are and I'm not saying they're not I'm just kind of interested in, in thinking about that so for example our notion of, of the subject that we've talked about our notion of the public and private kind of goes back to the book that kind of notion in the Gutenberg galaxy from Marshall McLuhan. Now, if we follow the Haraway and the Hills and we're moving out of that, then how are we still understanding this mainly through writing, text, story, narrative? Most of the time, everyone's just been showing quotes from people's books and written texts. How are we actually moving beyond that to be thinking of something different, not necessarily in an oppositional way, but you could have it in a more diffractive way, but we still, how, what are we doing any different from what we'd expect any normal humanities person to do? Stand up, give a paper, talk about some texts up there. I do it, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying how can we use this to push that on a little, and not just do, again, uh, something that Lissy said, just produce more text, which is what Latour does, it's what, it's what we all do. Well, thank you, thank you very much for this question because I think it 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 it's it's a very important one because it allows me to to say that um, I don't see the post humanities necessarily as a move 
beyond something. But what I've tried to, to show is that in order to reach all the non-oppositional, non-dualistic notions that we, are, that we try to reach these days in what it, the field that is called the post-humanities, but we can also call it feminist, you know, or post-colonial STS or something like that, implies that we, that we have to move that we have to position our research in a way before the human subject has been given agency. And that is, and, and before the human subject has emerged as an entity that has like uh, some sort of board, border around him or herself. So, and this is why I try to, uh, you know, I, I try to experiment successfully or unsuccessfully unsuc with diffractive reading and try to really unpack it to the, the most micro level possible. Because Barad, when she, when she uh, kind of introduces it, she says, um, I'm reading oeuvres through one another. And my question then is, okay, so what, is this a conscious decision? And if this is a conscious decision, then the methodology is not post-human, then the, me the methodology is, is humanist. So, uh, which is, which is, not the gesture that I think she wants to make with post-humanist performativity. And I think this is also why I, I appreciated the, um, the move that was made in uh, Niam's paper, for example, in which there was also this idea like, look, I cannot interpret these fragments, these interview fragments, if I really assume that I'm talking to a fully conscious uh, human being. And, and I think what, what you try to do with your experimental um, practices, with your experimental methodology, was also to reach a certain kind of like way of talking or way of thinking about thinking or about doing scholarship before there actually is this bounded human subject. Uh, and funnily, what I found very funny was on, on one of those slides you, sh you showed, the, the scholar also put like, thinking, like indicated thinking, this little like lamp, you know, and it was where she or he had put the desk. So there was like lots of thinking going on, but the, the, the formation of the idea was behind the desk. So I think it is very difficult, even with experimental methodology, to get rid of this, this idea that we know what thinking is. But this is why, I mean, of course, like my, this, as you can see, I'm very bad with like the podcast was my, my great attempt at bringing in some, some experimentation. So it's not, as a philosopher, it's not my, my skill. But on the other hand, I, I was also trying to show that it's not, it's not necessary to go beyond something because it is, we have to find our post-humanist non-oppositional thought before a clear human subject has been formed. I don't know. if you want to go there. Just very briefly, I think, oh, I think there's a difference between, for me, um, the post-human as a set of, um, sort, of anal a sort of analytical apparatus. That, I think that's what I use more, really, to look at social practices through that lens as opposed to trying to do post-humanities. You know, I think you're right that, that there are two different things. Um, why would we call it literacy? Uh, and for, for example, uh, mm -hmm. your image of the fox. Yeah. If a fox could kind of do this sort of thing, would it write? Yeah, well, it that's... It would do something else. Yeah, I mean, that's slightly tongue-in-cheek. But I think also the, what I try to do is look at how different intellectual traditions have, have been sort of working. I've been sort of looking at the same set of phenomena with different sort of theoretical lenses, you know, so like literacy studies, for example, I think has actually been trying to make an account of this, but hasn't, I don't think, had the, the, the enough um, emphasis on, on the non-human to be able to do it successfully. But anyway, it's a really, really good question. I don't have a great answer for it, but I, I think you, it's a really good, it's a, it's a good challenge. Sorry, I'm lifting the microphone. Questions or responses? One. Thank you, everybody. Can I ask, ask one final question? Because I, I do think that you can make, and this is also what I think you both did in your papers, is if we think about 
post-humanities methodologies that there is this dual move of at the same time reappropriating what are already or what we see as humanist matters, like what you explained, Woody, but at the same time there's this almost this move towards trying out new methods like a diffractive reading. Um, and I'm very interested in this kind of how this is a dual move that is at the same time a reappropriation of what we've already been doing. So just to get beyond this beyond before or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, there is a trying to do something different because if we, if it's only reappropriation, we don't get much further, I think. And the question is then how much this would entail a form of humanist agency when we're already kind of entangled in these networks. So it doesn't necessarily need to be something that we do, but it's part of how the whole media landscape is, is changing, how our environments are changing, and in that sense, our reconfiguring of our methods becomes something maybe natural to that move or to that process. I don't know if that makes any sense. Oh, I mean, this, this Invisibilia podcast is really, it's really interesting. It really asks the question, like, what are the effects, the material effects of the immaterial? And this was... I, I really saw new materialism in popular culture. In, I don't know if podcasts are popular culture, but I thought, okay, this is something out there that has a lot to do with the work that lots of new materialist um, scholars are, or post-humanist uh, scholars are also doing. Um, and I think just what I would add maybe is something about the, the kind of the reappearance of talk and text being also about the intractability of humanism. I mean, about, about maybe the kind of realization of how very difficult it is to, um, to kind of yeah, okay, it's right not to get beyond it, <laughs> but to kind of rethink it or to undo ourselves, I suppose, in the way that Butler is talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about this kind of project and realising that actually it's a, an awful lot more difficult <laughs> and that, you know, it's not very easy to divest ourselves um, of various kinds of humanist legacies um, as m much as we might wish or much as we might understand ourselves as outside of them or objected by them or whatever. So, yeah. Final questions, comments? Everybody wants a drink, I guess. So I'd like to thank everybody here for a fantastic seminar. So thank you very much. <laughs> Panelists.